Let's pray. Father, as we look into your word today, God, and as we learn about this idea of having an eternal perspective on life and living life in view of that perspective, Father, may your word stand true. May your word challenge us. May your word pierce our hearts. Father, and may we be challenged tonight. And may we leave here more like Jesus than we came here. So Lord, speak to our hearts. And may your word come alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good evening. My name is Pastor Mike. And tonight we're going to look at this idea of having an eternal perspective. And I want to tell you guys a story that will hopefully help us to grasp this idea. In my last church, we had a drummer named Bill. And Bill loved life. He lived life to the fullest. A few years ago, he had heart surgery. And he had five of his six arteries cleared. And as a result of that, he wanted to be as big as possible. He wanted to live life as big as possible. And so he decided that he was going to do everything fun and enjoy it. And he was just going to have friends and, and love on them. And man, Bill was a great drummer. And, and over the year that I got to know him, I got to learn that he loved God and believed in him. But back in October, we were beginning our rehearsal on a Sunday morning. And Bill never showed up. We were wondering, where is he at? And so as we were beginning to practice, our, our keyboard player, Doug, gets a, a text from Bill that says, on the way to the hospital, not feeling well. And so we prayed for Bill, asking that God would, would help him feel better, not knowing the, the ultimate outcome. And as we were about to play and, and rehearse again, we get a phone call, and that was from the nurse at a hospital that says Bill's heart stopped, and he's not going to make it. And so at that point, all the band members left, and it was just me. So I was about to lead worship that morning, and pastor, the pastor and his son decided, hey, we're going to play with you. And so we rehearsed, and at the end of the rehearsal. I get a call from Doug that said that Bill passed away. And I was planning this sermon this week, that idea and his story just came to my mind. A man that lived life to the fullest. And at any point, life can end as we know it. And so knowing that life is temporary, we're all faced with the question, how do we live life in view of that? And if there's an idea that I want to get across that I want you to know is this, is that we can live life with an eternal perspective, by doing good, enjoying life, and fearing God. Let me say that again. We can live life with an eternal perspective, by doing good, enjoying life, and fearing God. And so many of you guys are questioning, what is this eternal perspective? What are you talking about? Well, as we get started this morning, open up to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And I'll give you a little time to get there. I'm reading from the New Living's Translation, the NLT, this morning. And before we get started, I wanted to just catch you up on the first couple chapters of this, of, of this book. See, many scholars are debating on who wrote it. Was it just some random person, or, or was there a, a, a strong leader that wrote it? And many scholars also agree that, that this teacher, that this writer was Solomon. He was the son of King David. And he starts the book off talking about how everything is meaningless. Everything is vanity under the sun. And that no matter what we do, it's vanity. And he starts chapter 3 talking about this idea that there is a time for everything. There's a time to die and a time to live. A time to mourn. And 
a time to be happy, a time to kill and a time to heal. And so we had this view that, that there was a time for everything, that we just live in a world just of time. And starting in verse 9, we're going to start off with it. And it says this. It says, well, what do people really get for all their hard work? I've seen the burden God has placed on us all. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He's planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. So I concluded there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor, for these are gifts from God. And then know that whatever God does is final. Nothing can be added to it or, t or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. What is happening now has happened before. And what will happen in the future has happened before. Because God makes the things happen over and over again. May God bless his word. Amen. So we're all left with this question, well, what do we do? And then in verse 9, that question comes up. Well, then what do we get for all of our hard labor and all of our hard work? And what is it that we strive for? Why are we working? If a time is for everything, do we get something in return for it? And the first thing we see is that God is the ultimate one that gives us everything. That everything that we own is given by God. And a part of that idea is that in verse 11 it says this. It says, yet God has made everything beautiful for its time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. And the question that comes up is, well, what is this eternity? What is God placing in our heart? Well, the, the crux of the matter, the, the pinpoint of this is that eternity means that, that there's something bigger than ourselves. That we're fighting, that we're striving for something bigger. And we're hungry for something that's outside of ourselves. And this eternity they were talking about is this idea that God lives forever. And that we are striving for what lies ahead and what's after our life. We long for something greater than ourselves. And James McDonald, the pastor of Vertical Church, says this, The universal longing at the core of every human heart is for eternity. We yearn for something lasting, even as we hustle through busy days filled with families and jobs, and traffic and hobbies and entertainment and rest. There's a whisper in the back of our minds that pulls us towards something deeper and infinitely more significant. And that comes from his devotional or, or his study guide called Vertical Church. And it's said here that we are meant to focus vertically on the ultimate creator of everything. The one that has created everything beautiful in his time. And the question that we have is this. Are you living out that perspective? If we are striving for something bigger than ourselves. And Solomon's saying, and he answers this. Not in a direct way, but he says, your work is because there's something bigger. So at first he's addressing this idea of what are they working for? That they're striving for something bigger and something better. And so that is why we get this idea as we go forward that we can live life with an eternal perspective by doing good, loving life, and fearing God. And we're going to see that in this passage. That that's what Solomon is getting at. That in view of this perspective, let's live life. Let's do good. And so we have this idea starting in verse 12. In the NLT it says, So I concluded there's nothing better than to be happy and enjoy ourselves as long as we can. But in the NIV and in the ESV it says, basically this idea of doing good. This idea that in light of this perspective, knowing that time is valuable, knowing that we are striving for something bigger than ourselves, best thing that we can do is do good. And in Galatians 6, 9, Paul says this, And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. 
And so the reward, essentially, uh, of working hard, that when we do good, eventually we are going to reap what we sow if we don't give up and we continue to do good. See, doing good is something that's going to benefit humanity. It's going to benefit the world. And ultimately, it's going to worship God. But so many of us don't live that out in our lives. We are so focused on, on serving ourselves that we forget that there's others that we need to do good to, that we need to love and cherish. And Gandhi, a great influencer of his time, said this, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. What is he saying there? What does he mean? Well, he means that Jesus' life was spent doing good. That his life was spent focusing on things that have an eternal perspective. His life was so focused on bringing heaven to earth that all he focused on was blessing people and serving them and healing the sick and the blind and just loving life. And the question I have for you this morning is how are you living out this perspective and the good that you do? Are you living in an internal perspective by doing good and are you doing good? And what does that look like? And so we get this idea that we can live life with an internal perspective by doing good. But the question is, does it stop there? Do we stop at just doing good or is there more to life than just doing good? And Solomon continues in his passage in 13 and he says this, And people should eat and drink and enjoy the fruits of their labor. For there are gifts from God. The second thing we need to do with, as we live this life with an eternal perspective is that we can love life and we can be content with what we have. And Solomon is saying that, that should be our ultimate goal. That instead of worrying about gaining something, we should love and be thankful for what we have. And Solomon challenged his readers and his listeners to enjoy it and be thankful. And this idea of living life and loving it really hit me a few years ago. In my first church that I served in in New Jersey, I had a chance of going on a mission trip with the church. And we went to the Dominican Republic. And we always have this mindset that when we go somewhere, we go on a mission trip, we are going to, to challenge them, to, to invest into them, and, and, to, and to make their life better. But boy, was I wrong. Was I about to get a wake up. So we're going there, and the first day we go to our compound, and the next day we go out. And as we're going... We meet people who are living in metal shacks. Literally, their shacks were the smaller than even my bedroom. They're smaller than my kitchen, my dining room. These shacks were, were, were small, and inside, some of them had six to ten people. But you would think that they would be unhappy, and you would think that they would desire something bigger. But the more we got to talk to them, what they said was this. Is that, yeah, we don't have the money that you guys have. But we don't need that. We're content with what we got. Because nothing is worth more than knowing Jesus Christ. And so they were happy of just having themselves, their family, the things that they have. And ultimately, they were happy with Jesus Christ. What a story. I went changed and convicted of the things that I had because I don't know about you, but for me, how many of you guys have one of these, these smartphones? And I don't know about you, but anytime a new one comes out, I want it. I desire to have the new phone, the new way of doing things. And that day I was convicted. Because life is more than just these. Life is more than having all the money in the world. Because what I've seen, and what Solomon says in the first two chapters, and, and you can read this book because it's, 
it's filled with wisdom. See, Solomon was a man full with wisdom that God has given him. And what Solomon says is that there's nothing under the sun that's going to make us happy. That there's nothing under the sun that's going to fulfill our longing, fulfill our hearts. And we're going to keep striving and we're going to keep working and we're going to keep desiring the bigger and better things, but nothing is going to happen. And as 1 Corinthians 10.31 says this, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. It means that everything we have is God's anyway. So let's be thankful for what we have. And the question is, is how are you living out this perspective and view of being content and enjoying life? Are you striving? Are you ungrateful? Do you want the bigger and better things? We can live life with an internal perspective by doing good and loving life. But there's something bigger than that. There's something bigger than doing good and loving life. And, and if you heard my full idea, the ultimate goal that we should have, the ultimate goal that we need to strive for is this idea that when we live from an eternal perspective, we must and we can fear God. And if you look in verse 14, it says this, And as I know that whatever God does is final, nothing can be added to it or taken from it. God's purpose is that people should fear him. So if God has already set everything in stone, and whatever God does is final, what is our reward? What are we longing for? What do we desire? Well, the ultimate thing that we should desire is this idea of fearing God. Many of you are looking at it like, fear God. I thought God was a loving God. I thought God was somebody that we are to love. What is this idea of fearing God? Well, this fear is not a scared fear. You know, it's not like going down a roller coaster and you're just like, ah! This fear is not a, a hide in the closet or hide in your bedroom because you're scared because somebody's breaking in. This idea of fear is this idea of reverence or awe. That we are to revere Christ and we are to live in awe of who God is. Well, what does that look like? What does it look like to revere God? Well, it's this idea of honoring Him and being obedient to Him and lifting Him up as the King of our lives and the Savior of our lives. And then there's this idea of awe. You amazed at who God is? Do you understand how big God is? If God has created this world and created everything beautiful in its time, what are we living for? My wife and I, Becky, went on a an anniversary trip this past September. And many of you guys are gonna think this is weird, but we decided to take a trip throughout South Dakota. You're probably wondering, what is in South Dakota? Why are you driving to South Dakota and what is there? Well, I could tell you that if you truly want a different perspective of who God is, and you want to fear God and you want to strengthen that and you want to revere Him and you want to live in awe of who He is, take a trip to South Dakota. And so on our trip, we planned to visit a few places and so we visited the Badlands. One of the first stops we went to is we went through the Badlands and people were saying go to the Badlands and we're like why would we go to a place that is bad? What is there? And so we're driving through the Badlands and man it just opened up and there was cliffs and there was dirt mountain ranges and rock formations and it was incredible there were animals that I've never seen before like bison and prairie dogs and I was just blown away and another place we went to outside of Mount Rushmore is Custer State Park now Custer State Park is a state park in South Dakota and we're driving around these cliffs and it just opens up and you just see valleys and you see the mountains and my mind was so blown by who God is because of this that I came back motivated to serve him and worship him because how big and how awesome he is. Have you ever just looked up in the stars? 
or, or drove in it and watched the snow fall. Or watch videos of whales swimming in the ocean and you see these big, massive, majestic creatures. And you're just like, man, God, you are so awesome. That is what living in the awe of God is. God is so big, so mighty, so great. And the question is, do you fear God? Do you live in all of him? Do you revere him as Lord and Savior? of your life. We can live life with an eternal perspective by doing good, loving life, and fearing God. And Solomon knew that, and he was letting him know that no matter what is happening, the ultimate goal should not be to focus on what you get in return. But what you should be doing is living life in view of the eternity that God has placed in our hearts. We have this longing and in that view, we are to do good. And we are to love and be content with life. And we are to fear God. And all of this. However, the question is, what does this look like in our lives? What does it look like in my life? What does it look like in your life? See, most of us go through life trying to fulfill a longing in our hearts. That's why we see people to try that fill their broken hearts with something like drugs or alcohol or unhealthy relationships or, or sex. Or they fill them with friends or, or they just like to buy things because they have a longing that's so bigger than who they are. We give into this lie then in order to fulfill that hole that is vacant. The longing that we have, we need to find things that make us happy. But we all know that that isn't entirely true. Yes, we do need to find the one thing that makes us happy. But that one thing is God himself. Blaise Pascal, a philosopher, said this. He said, what else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim? But that there is once a man in true happiness, of which we all that now remain is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are not there to help. He cannot find in those that are. The none can help, since this infinite abyss can be filled only with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, but God himself. So what he's saying is that there's a God-shaped vacuum in our hearts that people try to fill, but the only thing that can fill it is God himself. See, some of you are here searching for that fulfillment. You're here longing to fulfill what you're longing for. That eternity that has been placed in your heart is the knowledge of God that only God can fill. We all have that knowledge. But the question is, do you desire to unlock the full potential of eternity? We know that there's something out there. We thought it was other things, but the Bible says in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. And Jesus said in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He has not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. This longing that you have in your heart is ultimately a longing to be in the community of God. To be in a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. See, Jesus Christ came and he died for you on the cross and rose again. So that you can fully have this eternal life and live in that eternal perspective. The question is, do you want to live a life with a fulfillment that goes deeper than anything else you've ever tried before? Are you ready to give Christ a chance on fulfilling that longing? Do you wait? Don't wait any longer, but fulfill that longing with the only one that can, and that's Jesus Christ. See, the Bible says in John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And Romans 10, 13 says, if we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, we will be shaved. So call on the name of the Lord. It's so easy. The Bible says, confess and believe that Jesus Christ died that he rose again for your sins, so that you can have eternal life. The Bible says that if you believe that, 
you will have life and have it to abundantly. But if you already know Jesus and you've already believed, if you've already been captured by the grace of God and received the salvation he's offered, you've already passed from death to life, you've already received eternal life and you're living in the reality of eternity, but the question is, is how are you living in view of that eternity? How you are living in view of what God has placed in our hearts. See, we learned today that we can live with an eternal perspective by doing good, loving life, and fearing God. The question is, is how are you doing good? How are you living out life? See, there's many things that we can do. We can love our neighbor. A great way of doing good in Mark 12, 31 Jesus says in the great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. And so are you living in view of that? Are you loving your neighbor? That's a way of doing good. Another way we can do good is using our gifts. Are you utilizing what you have to bless others? Are you passionate about that? Are you involved here at this church? Or if you are visiting and you're a member of another church, are you being challenged by that? Are you living out that life in that perspective? How are you doing good? Or another way we can do is we can sacrifice ourselves. The Bible says in Romans 12, 1, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to be a living sacrifice. Are you giving of your time, of your energy, of your money? Are you giving of yourselves so that you can help somebody else? Are you loving life? In Matthew 6, the Bible talks about don't worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. But focus on seeking God. Are you being appreciative of what you have? Are you content with who you are? Are you answering this question of, is it possible to love God with the little things in your life and not having a desire for extreme larger things? Reevaluate your life. Be challenged. Are you living in the moment of being content and loving life. And finally, do you fear God? Do you find amazement in who he is and what he has done? Do you revere him as king and lord of your life? The greatest example that we have is Jesus Christ himself. And he spent his whole life doing good. All throughout scripture we see of his healing, of his feeding the homeless, blessing the less needy. Investing in the those that feel outcasted. See, Jesus Christ in Acts 10, the Bible says the Holy Spirit filled him and he did good. He spent his life speaking about being content. And he willfully obeyed God along the way. Philippians says that he obeyed God and he feared God to the point of dying on a cross. So he didn't consider himself as God, but he declared himself and he humbled himself and died on the cross for our sins. The Bible says in Romans 3.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ the Lord. Everything that Jesus Christ did was to point to eternity, where our ultimate reward of honoring God comes from. So you ask, what is your reward of honoring God? It's eternal life in his presence. Paul says, No one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, haul, stray, each one's work will become manifest. For the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has, has built on the foundation survives, he will receive his reward. This is coming from 1 Corinthians. And so the question is, what is your reward? Your reward is ultimately eternity eternal life with Jesus Christ, and we have to live that out. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for placing eternity in our hearts and for that longing, because without it, we will not know that we need you. I pray that we will live out the eternal perspective by doing good, enjoying life, that you bless us with, and ultimately fearing you as our God and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for providing the ultimate example for us to follow and living the way you called us to live. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.